the transverse arch. Hey guys, this is Grown and Healthy, the channel where we explore self-improvement through movement. Arches are a big deal, thought of solely as weight-bearing structure due to the analogous arch that we see in engineering. But this is not the whole truth. You see, they also act as a spring, bearing the weight of the body and also absorbing any shock that is created. Think of the arches more as springboards than static shapes. Modern humans are suffering with collapsed arches. And if you're watching this channel, you may be more concerned with the position of your instep or your medial arch. But did you know that you have three arches in the sole of your feet? The three arches of the feet are the medial arch, the lateral arch, and the transverse arch. In this video, we're gonna discover those hidden arches and how they can help you move forward. The arch structure enhances energy efficiency by enabling the accumulation and release of mechanical energy that's generated during the loaded action of walking and running. So to begin with, while it is easy to identify the medial arch with thousands of photos of insteps across the internet, the lateral instep is lesser documented. As for the transverse arch, even less. As I've pointed out in previous videos, the lateral edge is the natural strike zone for our feet, whether walking or running. This can be considered a triangle area, a wide tortilla chip that has some curve as most tortilla chips do. The transverse arch, keep in mind the capabilities of arches of the body, ends at the base of the pinky toe the same point at which the lateral arch coincidentally ends. So let's put some more focus on the transverse arch and how we can regain function of this vital area. This is basically a bridge that uh, is held together by muscle that has the shape. You know, again, our feet are similar to our hand and it resembles how your hand resembles in terms of this transverse arch on the hand correlates to the transverse arch on the foot. Well, the transverse arch uses a few muscles to stay in shape, but I believe the most important is the adductor hallucis. The adductor hallucis goes from the first ray, which is the big toe, towards the fifth toe, squeezing together, lifting up the toes in between to create the transverse arch. Stiffness of the Human Foot and Evolution of the Transverse Arch, which was published the 26th of February in the Journal of Nature. Researchers from the University of Warwick, working in collaboration with Yale University, pose that the transverse arch may play an equally important role as the medial. The collaboration found that the transverse arch is a bigger source of foot stiffness than what was previously thought of the longitudinal arch. Hey, if you're finding this helpful, please press the like button and consider sharing this with people who could benefit. Some illustrations are being deceptive by showing these definite points as if a tripod, but in truth, these should be seen as regions. The heel pad cuts the line short. The true articulation line is evident when you're viewing the sole from underneath. The lower end of the lateral arch is at this bump of the lateral edge, the tuberosity of the fifth. And when you engage those bones in line with the small toe, you will sense where the lever of your foot truly articulates. Creating this triangular lever, the power created from coordinated contraction lifts the foot, allowing for applied force to aid in your propulsion. And it's also a great dampening mechanism for landing. If you've ever seen someone stutter jump, which is what we commonly engage in when we're slightly unsure or fatigued, you can look at the instinctive load placed onto the triangle. So now you know where that extra oomph comes from. Power comes from the ball of the foot, but it's aided significantly by this springboard. The calcaneus has no such dynamic mechanism. It can take some impact, but not this repeated onslaught. This is why the cushions on conventional shoes are as large and cushioned as technology can accommodate. Why, if this is the natural way? Why is it that the shoes that are designed wider at the heel, considering the narrowness of the heel, yet the anatomically wider forefoot 
is constrained in comparison. Well, obviously the one that is smaller or has a narrower surface area is demanding that bolstering of a wider surface. But the impact of a heel kick is devastating. The reason is also because of the small surface area. If I were to throw a light pitch of a hard ball to your hand, where would you prefer for the ball to impact? At the heel of your hand or the flexible palm? And we aren't talking about this fatty pad here. This is the analogous ball of the big toe. You can look it up. The heel of the hand is solely in this section. So how many throws do you think you could take to the heel of your hand? Even a tennis ball would be numbing. I mean, you can just see right here how annoying it is. And this is why your ankles are so susceptible to rolling. Not only does the lateral arch have a fat pad, it also has a spring mechanism capable of dampening and rebounding. This makes it easier on your body because you're not as jarred with every step. That's why you find it beneficial to tiptoe when you're walking silently because you have greater control, not just because of the speed, you could easily tiptoe as fast as you could walk even run. It is the level of control that you have with the forefoot that the heel does not. And that control is also known as stability. And your ankles in particular will benefit with the forefoot approach because the transverse arch will assist with the balance of the ankle while the heel strike will leave the ankle unassisted and more susceptible to injury. If you want to improve your foot mobility, take a look at grownliving.com where you can purchase a few tools that I believe will help you. At least they worked for me. So how does this affect your capabilities walking? Well, for the most part, when people suffer from a sprained ankle, it is rarely from being on the forefoot. It is often a heel strike that is then wobbling for stability and the subsequent adjustment, the micro adjustment that happens instantaneously creates that spraining. It is very rare for someone to actually go outside of the bounds of their ankle's capability by just pressing on the forefoot. And so what you can practice through the forefoot walk is to land that small toe and big toe metatarsal pad, make an impact first with that, and then allow the heel to then fall. This small change will allow the ankle just the time that it needs to adjust to the terrain and to land without issue. So in the understanding of the three regions of your foot in which we place pressure, not only do you have the three points at the sole of your foot, but because of the shape of the transverse arch, you also get the benefits of stability going across the top line of the foot towards the ankle directly, not just the calcaneus. So you have a tetrahedron shaped structure of the three points of the heel, big toe, and small toe, but also an upper level, which goes from the ankle to the big toe and the small toe. So it is two triangles. And this shape creates stability. That is why I ask that you land first and then gently, if you're putting the heel down at all, lower the foot. And you're gonna see the difference in terms of the stability in your ankle and also the ease of your movement. There should always be a feeling of greater stability under the big toe and the small toe with a slight sensation from the toes in between. Because of the doming of the transverse arch, it won't have the same sensation once you're relaxed. Once you press onto the toes, then all of them will engage. Now, when it comes to building the mind-muscle connection with the transverse arch, here are a few exercises that I believe will work for you. Now, I always carry a lacrosse ball in my bag, but in this case, we're gonna need something 
slightly smaller in order to have the transverse arch fully encapsulate the ball. Just place it on the ground, place your foot on top. You want the pads of the toes in contact with the ball and you want to sweep from left to right using the heel as the pivot in order to kind of smooth out the sole of the foot in between the toes. You're trying to feel for each individual toe as you swing from side to side. You don't want too much pressure on it. It can uh, be uncomfortable after a while. So we're just taking a nice sweep side to side. And then after you've loosened up the sole of the foot, what you'd like to do is you want to start to grab the foot. Think of an eagle clawing its prey. And you want to just practice doing that. Switch the foot. Practice doing that. And you're really trying to get to a level where you can grab the ball. You're really trying to encapsulate that golf ball with your toes. The tighter you can get this, the better. Don't focus so much on between the big toe and the second toe. Focus more at the actual transverse arch and then squeeze down. So that's between the second and the third toe. Squeeze, then let go. Squeeze, then let go. You're trying for the toes to encapsulate the ball. And you can also roll over the lateral arch, which is from the base of the small toe to the fifth phalanx, this bump right here. And we're rolling that. I would do about 10 to 15 grabs of the ball. Stop before you feel any cramping. Okay, that's not what this is about. It's about gaining the sensation of your feet. It's not about getting hurt or being in pain. We are going to engage our foot into the toe off position, pointing the foot through the ball of the toe. We'll push the foot behind us. That way we can stabilize with the leading leg and then we can fully engage the windless mechanism without the resistance of our body weight. And we're going to press back. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to lift the toes and then lower the toes to the ground and then grip the ground. Engaging the foot, creating that tension, lifting the toes until just the pads of the toes are touching the ground and then lowering it and then gripping the ground. Raising, lowering. Be careful with the pressure that you place upon your foot. We're not trying to aggravate the foot in any way. We're just trying to gain that tension. What you will feel is a bridge going from the big toe or the pad of the big toe to the small toe. So again, lift, lower, lift, lower, lift, lower lift, lower. Again, be gentle on the pads of the toes. If that is too hard, you can bring the foot closer up to the leading leg and then lift, grab, lift, grab. You want to lift for three seconds maybe longer if you could hold it, and then grab for three seconds. With just these few exercises, you'll immediately feel your stability increase. You'd wanna keep this in your routine for as long as it takes for the feeling to come online. If there's just one point on the heel of which we're balancing, and there are two points of the forefoot in which we're balancing, then you can see where the greater stability lies. And it's not the heel. With this step forward, slightly landing, we have that stability and we can instantaneously almost drop into the heel without any wobbling. 
sensation. And that's what you want. You want balance and stability with every step. Not to mention the many other benefits of forefoot walking. This is just one of many. If you are suffering from chronic ankle sprains or any issues with the ankle, it is a lot easier to stay stabilized once you land on the forefoot. 